The murder of Daniel Morgan has never been solved. The Welsh private investigator was killed with an axe in a pub car park. I'm very sorry, but he's dead. What do you mean he's dead? You must have made it. Ah, oh, just lost the plot there. Despite five police investigations costing millions, no one's ever been convicted. Tonight, allegations of police corruption, links to the News of the World scandal and claims by those close to the murder hunt that they were targeted. The idea that your personal safety, your security at home has been undermined in that way is, is quite terrifying. For 24 years, Daniel's family have fought for justice. We're still carrying his coffin around, you know. We're still carrying him on our shoulders. It sh I shouldn't be here today. It should have never happened in the first place. The prosecution should have never even been started. Jonathan Rees and two other men walk free from court in March this year. They were each charged with murdering Daniel Morgan. They were each found not guilty. A cloud of suspicion had hung over Jonathan Rees and the two other men since 1987. All deny involvement in Daniel's murder. 24 years have passed since Daniel Morgan was killed in this pub car park. And since then, events have unfolded like the pages of a thriller. But behind all the twists and turns, there lies the heartache of a family, still grieving the loss of a father, a brother and a son. Daniel's mother, Isabel, is now 83, but she won't give up her fight for justice. I've got to, got to do it. It's just because we've become almost, you know, this, well, we've been 25 years nearly on this, and it's been so haphazard, so awful, and so traumatic. Isabel's leaving her home in Hay on Wye for a trip to London. She's hoping to get a meeting with the Home Secretary, Theresa May. It's a trip she's made countless times. I don't like going to London because. The only time I've been, I mean, it must be a couple of hundred times, at least. It's on this, these missions, you know. I, I would just love to one day to go to London and go to a shop. <laughs> this doesn't happen. This trip to the Home Office could signify the last chance of justice for Daniel. Home Secretary Theresa May has the power to grant a judicial inquiry into the murder. Isabel feels it's the only way the truth will come out now. Today might just be a turning point. I mean, nothing, nothing will bring Daniel back. But we, uh, there's so much that can be revealed. The trip is just the latest leg in Isabel's remarkable journey. But will she be able to persuade the Home Secretary? Daniel Morgan was brought up in Llanrechwe near Cumbran in Gwent. So, Alistair, you're the you're the eldest. Yeah. James the youngest. James the youngest, and, and then the Daniel's brother Alistair and his sister Jane have returned to the family home in South Wales for the first time in years. What sort of little boy was he? Oh, always <laughs> looking for Bob and a Buck, wasn't he? <laughs> he used to deliver the leaflets for the a shop. shop. He yeah. would see a battery or car battery or somebody's yeah. garden yeah. and yeah. knock, ring the bell, knock on the door and ask if he could have it. <laughs> we haven't been crying, which is strange. I feel that yeah. that's strange. We're laughing about the happy times. Not thinking about and all the funny things. That all happen. the funny things, like the boys yeah. setting fire to the hedge <laughs> and my father's fury, you know. <laughs> Daniel spent his childhood exploring the local countryside. He married a Scottish girl, Iris. They had two children, Sarah and Daniel, and he found work as a private detective. When it started, you just thought this this could be an interesting job, you know. 
it, it was something different, you know, not a run-of-the-mill, boring job. And so he engaged with that, you know. Daniel set up his own detective agency. Business was good, and he went into partnership with Jonathan Rees. Their company, Southern Investigations, was based at these offices in South London. The pair worked together for six years. But on the 10th of March, 1987, everything changed. Daniel left a meeting with Jonathan Rees at this pub in South London. It was the last time the Welshman was seen alive. His body was discovered in the car park. There was an axe embedded in his head. It was about four o'clock in the morning and I was, my telephone rang. And he said, this is, an, I'm an officer in the Metropolitan Police. Well, what are you ringing me up for? And he said, well, I'm very sorry, but he's dead. I said, what do you mean he's dead? You must have made, ah, oh, just lost the plot there. And I just, and I said, well, what's happened to him? Please tell me what has happened. Has he been run over? Um, I'm afraid I'm not in a position to tell you, he said. I can't tell you what it was like. I was absolutely devastated. I think I was screaming, I don't know. Speculation about the motive was rife. Daniel's Rolex watch had been stolen, but more than a thousand pounds in cash was still in his jacket. Police believed the nature of the attack, the axe left in Daniel's face, was personal. My whole being seemed to freeze. Oh, it was an unbelievable experience. I miss him terribly. He shouldn't have died like that. It was wicked. Daniel's line of work as a private investigator did bring him into conflict with people. Police interviewed countless witnesses who might have harboured a grudge, but who would want him dead and why remained a mystery. Then detectives discovered that the relationship between Daniel and his business partner, Jonathan Rees, had become strained. A year before the murder, Rees had agreed to provide security at a car auction business. Whilst trying to bank the firm's takings, Rees was robbed of £18,000. Things got worse. The car auction firm was now suing Jonathan Rees and Daniel over the missing money. Peter Newby was the office manager at Southern Investigations. He remembers the robbery causing tension. I think he was causing Danny more concern than it was John. Danny was more concerned with keeping an eye on the money side. John, I think his attitude was we're in business, this job could make a killing, let's go for it. Daniel also spoke to his brother Alistair about concerns over his business relationship with Jonathan Rees. Initially it seemed fine, you know, but then um, Dan would say things to me like, he's lazy, he spends all his day in the pub, you know, I'm driving all around the country and he he's just propping up the bar with his police friends, you know. He he's re spent a lot of time with the local police, and Dan didn't have a lot of time for the police. He thought they were he didn't hold them in high regard. But one thing they could not agree, and that was to agree. Daniel was certainly wary of John. How do you know that? He told me once. He said, Peter, never make a decision in this office that is going to affect this company unless you talk to me first. 
Jonathan Rees told us he and Daniel Morgan were different characters and their respective strengths were complementary in the business. They had arguments from time to time, but they were friends. The hunt for Daniel's killer continued. Officers discovered the policeman who took Jonathan Reese's statement the day after the murder was one of his friends. Detective Sergeant Sid Fillery was Reese's drinking pal. Three weeks after the murder, DS Fillery was arrested, together with Daniel's business partner Jonathan Reese, two other police officers, and Reese's two brothers in law. They were all released without charge the same day. With the police investigation stalling, they turned to Crime Watch for help. The police described the case as a sticker. In other words, it's one they just can't solve. You're also trying to find... Detectives appealed for information about the murder weapon. Actually, it's a Chinese done. axe are imported into this country in the thousands, but what is more significant is the way it's taped. It's, um got two elastoplasts uh, on the handle. As though to be gripped, like that. That's right, as if to assist the grip or to stop the perspiration from somebody's hands allowing it to, sw to slip. Crime Watch failed to provide a breakthrough, but the man leading the murder hunt was concerned at the behaviour of some officers in South London. He asked the Met for an outside force to take over the investigation. His request was declined. Further allegations of tensions between Daniel and his business partner, Jonathan Rees, were made during the inquest into Daniel's death. Kevin Lennon worked as a bookkeeper for Southern Investigations. He claimed that Rees wanted to kill Daniel. This is what he told the coroner's court. John Rees said again to me that he wanted Daniel Morgan killed. John Rees told me that Sid Fillery would be joining the firm after Daniel's murder. John Rees said, I've the perfect solution for Daniel's murder. My mates at Catford Nick are going to arrange it. Lennon's evidence to the inquest shocked Daniel's family. I wanted to shout out. Oh my God, this is filthy. This is corrupt. I thought, our suspicions are confirmed. Our worst fears have, are true. However, the impact of Kevin Lennon's evidence to the inquest, saying that Rees wanted to kill Daniel, was undermined, as it was uncorroborated. His credibility was also questioned, when Jonathan Rees not only denied wanting to kill Daniel, but he told the inquest Lennon made it up to curry favour with the police as he was facing fraud charges. It later emerged Detective Sergeant Sid Fillery had indeed left the police force and joined Southern Investigations with Jonathan Rees. First of all, we were obviously shocked that um, when Fillery was arrested, but then months went by, months and months and months, and I was in contact with the police regularly, you know, every week or couple of days or week, you know, at regular intervals I was ringing them. And you get sort of standard formulaic responses. We are pursuing a number of lines of inquiry. The family was demanding answers. Fifteen months after Daniel's murder, the Met finally asked an outside force to investigate. As a result of this inquiry by Hampshire police, Jonathan Rees was arrested a second time on suspicion of murder. This time, he was charged. But three months later, it was dropped, again on the grounds of insufficient evidence. In 1998, the Met launched a third investigation. Eleven years after Daniel's murder, detectives decided to bug the new offices of Southern Investigations. Police felt Operation Nigeria, using covert surveillance, was the best way to try to gather evidence. 
See what I would like at the end of the day. An intelligence report says Fillory and Rees are alert and have current knowledge of investigative methods and techniques. In addition, such is their level of access within the police service that the threat of compromise to any conventional investigation is constant. But in another dramatic twist, the bugging operation was stopped. Officers overheard a plot to plant cocaine on a woman. Rees was hired by a man to discredit his wife during a child custody battle. Rees arranged for cocaine to be planted in her car. Journalist Graham McLagan has followed Daniel Morgan's case for years. It was clear that Rees was going to fabricate evidence against the, the wife, plant drugs on her. Uh, here was a crime being committed and the, the police were listening into it, listening to the tape and, uh, and realising it was a crime and therefore they had to act. Jonathan Rees was jailed for seven years for the cocaine plot. A corrupt police officer who helped him was jailed for four years. But the bugging operation had failed to provide any evidence that Rees or his associates were involved in Daniel's murder. The covert surveillance did, however, reveal information about the work of Southern Investigations. It showed Rees had a relationship with a number of journalists. He was feeding stories to the tabloids, and in particular, the news of the world, for thousands of pounds. Basically, Rees was surrounded by corrupt officers, corrupt ex-officers, and officers who were prepared to pass him information. These, this would be information that they gathered on, on criminals uh, and perhaps also on celebrities. Uh, and Reese would get this information, uh, develop it to an extent, and sell it to newspapers, particularly the tabloid newspapers and particularly the News of the World. Another former bookkeeper at Southern Investigations, in an interview with BBC Radio, explains the extent of the business with the former Sunday tabloid newspaper. The News of the World really was the biggest customer. We used to invoice out maybe five to six hundred invoices a month. All the invoices were hand delivered to a man at News of the World. We've seen a copy of a witness statement to police. It claims that Daniel Morgan was planning to sell a story to a newspaper for £40,000. The paper was the news of the world. Two days before his murder, he had said that he was dealing with an issue of police corruption. He didn't trust anybody in the police to deal with it. So it, I would think, well, who else can deal with it? Then obviously the media is... Uh, is the next choice, isn't it? Do you have any idea what, what that story might have been? The story involved police in, in concert with the underworld and drugs, importation and dealing, in particular cocaine. In a separate development, the news of the world would come to the attention of detectives investigating the murder of Daniel Morgan again. In 2002, the police turned to Crime Watch once more. We acknowledge there were some difficulties in the early stages of this investigation, but I'm here tonight to reinvestigate it with the advantage of 15 years of knowledge. A fourth murder inquiry was underway, headed up by Detective Chief Superintendent Dave Cook. Coincidentally, his wife was a presenter on the programme. You can call us anonymously if you want, 0500 600 600. Genius, tell us what you've got. A lot of the day after the programme was broadcast, Detective Chief Superintendent Cook was told that there was intelligence suggesting that suspects in the Daniel Morgan murder case were trying to discredit him. It was a development that affected his whole family. But we were convinced and the Met were convinced that it was a serious threat, sufficient enough for us to be put under the Witness Protection Programme and we had officers allocated to us um, to give us assistance and our security at home was beefed up. My whole life was destabilised. It was like somebody 
put a bomb underneath my sense of security. Our mail was tampered with. And on several occasions, um, vans were seen in the area. David was followed. Um, and I, was, I saw a van keeping surveillance on our house. Uh, on one occasion, there was a brake light broken on, I think something similar, on one of the vans, and he arranged to have it stopped by local uniform police officers in Surrey, um, who did so, and they discovered um, that it was being driven and occupied by two um, employees of News International, the News of the World. Now, this was a huge shock. It dominates your life. It, everything you do, everywhere you go, is done um, with one eye over your shoulder. Former News of the World editor Rebecca Brooks was asked about the surveillance of DCS Cook's family whilst he was heading the murder hunt. She's understood to have claimed the paper was investigating whether Jackie Haynes was having an affair with Mr Cook. They were married and had even been featured in a magazine. These are the pictures that actually appeared in um, Hello magazine. They sent them through to us, um, as you can see. It just wasn't a secret. It's not as if we'd hidden something away. Um, so clearly that was a ridiculous explanation and appeared to me anyway to be one that had been thought up on the spur of the moment. The MP, Tom Watson, who's fought to highlight the hacking perpetrated by the News of the World, says the surveillance of the man heading the Morgan murder hunt is concerning. It's a remarkable series of relationships that su suggest to me there needs to be a much deeper inquiry into what exactly was going on in that particular time. The Met took no further action, but week in week out has uncovered another opportunity the police had to investigate links between Southern investigations and the news of the world. We've discovered a senior officer on the Daniel Morgan murder inquiry contacted the anti-corruption command at the Metropolitan Police. The officer expressed concern that attempts were being made to discredit his boss, Dave Cook. He asked the Met to investigate the news of the world's links to Southern investigations. Again, the Met did nothing. There are obviously no-go areas in that relationship. Uh, in terms of investigation, insight, there are places where people are not allowed to look. Well, I'm afraid this is yet more reputational harm for the Metropolitan Police in London. We asked the Metropolitan Police for an interview, but they declined and refused to make any comment. On March the 10th this year, Daniel Morgan's family came to the Golden Lion pub car park to remember him. It was the 24th anniversary of his death. A painful day for the family. Just 24 hours later, the most recent attempt by the Metropolitan Police to bring the case to trial collapsed. Jonathan Rees and his two brothers-in-law, Glenn and Gary Vyan, were cleared of murder. A fourth man, Jimmy Cook, was cleared last November. The case against former policeman and Rees's business partner, Sid Fillery, was suspended last February. He'd been accused of attempting to pervert the course of justice. I feel so devastated, so... so torn apart, wounded, and felt soulless, and all the effort that had gone in had crashed around us, you know, the time and the energies and the mental agony of keeping it alive a lot of the time. The latest case against the men had rested on the evidence of supergrasses. The problem with using supergrasses as witnesses is that they themselves are criminals. Their credibility and their motivation for giving evidence is often questioned. Indeed, one man had his prison sentence of 25 years cut to three years for helping the inquiry. One by one, 
the testimony of Supergrass after Supergrass was dropped. Finally, the prosecution decided not to proceed towards a full-blown jury trial after admitting there were crates of evidence the defence hadn't seen. The prosecution should have never even been started. Um, so whether you say it's a good day or not, um, I shouldn't have been here in the first place. And I'm quite angry about it. The Met now admitted corruption had hindered the original murder investigation. It is quite apparent that police corruption was a debilitating factor in that investigation, and this was wholly unacceptable. It has been the co conduct of the police from beginning to end on this, and the accumulation of incompetence and corruption that, that, that has led to the colla final collapse of the trial. Five failed police inquiries, thousands of witness statements, 40 potential suspects investigated. Now Daniel's family are focusing their energies on getting a judicial inquiry. Last month, Daniel's mother Isabel travelled from Mid Wales to join Alistair at the Home Office. And I'll be out in either three hours or two minutes. <laughs> Half a minute. She was determined to see Home Secretary Theresa May to press her case for a judicial inquiry. And I've come all the way from Wales. For 25 years we have been trying desperately, my surviving son and myself, to have justice. <laughs> No face-to-face -face meeting, but today the family were told Theresa May will meet them in early December. Daniel's murder will also be brought up at the Leveson inquiry into hacking and the press. Jackie Haynes will give evidence. And the MP Tom Watson is supporting the family's fight for an inquiry. The Morgan family have not only gone from through hell, but justice has not yet been done. The Met themselves have admitted uh, that there was corruption at the heart of the, in the investigation. And I think it's really important that we have a public inquiry to get to the facts. Alistair is still hoping, searching for answers about the murder, so that he might finally say goodbye to his brother. We're still carrying his coffin around, you know. We're still carrying him on our shoulders. We haven't buried him, he hasn't been laid to rest. We've buried him in the physical sense, but he's never been laid to rest, you know, in the, in, the, in the true sense of the word. And at 83 years old, Daniel's mother feels the family have been let down. I don't have time on my side. The years are going by quickly. What have we achieved so far? Nothing. Really, nothing. He single-handedly changed the world of hairdressing. Imagine meets Vidal Sassoon next. <laughs>